Play Festival earlier, earlier this year, and I was in Melbourne, where I met Declan and Vanessa, and I had a marvelous time, and I just remember thinking, and I'm struck by something that you said to me after your first trip to New York, which was last week, you know, how amazingly crazy and wonderful it felt to you, and I said, but Dan, it's strange, you've lived in Singapore, you've lived in major, major cities, bigger cities than New York, why does it feel so wonderful and marvelous, and I think what you said rang very true to me about my experience with Australia, that it is extremely foreign, but extremely similar to my experience. Uh, and while I was in Australia and seeing the marvelous work that I saw, I was really struck by the way the playwrights were, so many playwrights were dealing with many of the same issues that American playwrights deal with, issues of race, issues of gender, issues of sexuality, uh, because the country is very similar, much closer to United States, frankly, from a cultural perspective, than I think of the, than I think of the UK or Scotland or Ireland or any other English-speaking country, because the geography is similarly spread out. There are similarly two poles, uh, 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 poles uh, between Melbourne and Sydney, one LA, one New York, or you know, you can say LA and New York, or the Melbourne and Sydney. <laughs> United States. However, I'm, we're trying to be very nice to you. Uh, <laughs> make you feel a little better. Uh, uh, no, but very similar in also dealing with crushing immigration problems, long history of racial oppression, and trying to deal with those uh, uh, those things creatively and culturally. And that was where the idea of this panel discussion or conversation or whatever came about. And we called it a smackdown only because here at Woolly down the uh, down the hall when we were putting this together, the elaborate entrance of Chad Deity was playing. And those of you that know that play is all about wrestling. And so I saw the play, and then in the morning I was like, oh, we're going to call it the Australian American Smackdown. So Dan has a prize for whoever wins. Do you want to show us? Uh, yeah. It should be a surprise. It should be a surprise. Oh, because they'll throw the game. It is a surprise. It's full bottle. <laughs> of blueberry beer. It's a, it's a traditional Australian gift. <laughs> and it's very bad manners to refuse. <laughs> hey, you bear. Can the, can the moderators smack down the panel and win the blueberry? <laughs> so, Indeed, in order to make this, uh, uh, to make it even, even, we couldn't do just one moderator, we had to do two moderators. I've already given last night, those of you were, uh, that were here, uh, an encomium to Todd, and I'm not going to do it again. Damn it. <laughs> Sorry, I told you. Uh, uh, but Todd London is uh, Artistic Director of New Dramatists in New York. If you don't know the organization, go visit the website, which is quite beautiful. Learn all about Todd, who is, uh, in addition to being a vital force in American theater, um, uh, a novelist in his own right, and an artist in his own right, uh, so you should go out and buy his books. 
And he's also got this fabulous book coming out. And you've got, get up, Stop, I don't say you're not going to do it. All right. <laughs> Done. Let me talk about Christine Evans to your left. Uh, Christine Evans is sort of, she's, she's sort of um, a switch hitter, right? I'm an undercover agent for Australia. That's right. You're, you're a bi-curious playwright because you're an Australian <laughs> but have lived in the United States for the past 15 years. An amazing playwright. Twelve, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, an amazing playwright, plays in Blue Trojan Barbie, Weightless, one of my favorites, Pussy Boy, for reasons I'll tell you later. Um, uh, and many times awarded with fellowships and... Uh, honors and so on. You can certainly go on her website to learn more about it. And I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to give you all the information about the playwrights that are here uh, because they're all in your programs. You'll be able to read their bios, but I'm delighted that we have Carson Kreitzer here, uh, Jacqueline Lawton. If you didn't meet Jacqueline uh, or Jackie last night, you can so. Why are you smiling? Well, she did. I wasn't there. Oh, you weren't there. Yes, I <laughs> you weren't there. She is delightful and wonderful. She's been blogging all week, actually. Um, is it JacquelineLawton.com? Yes, JacquelineLawton.com. So I'll be taking lots of pictures, so just be prepared to be gorgeous. Yes. <laughs> She's one of the four playwrights on here. She's West. Uh, Carlos Murillo, whose play Diagram of a Paper Airplane, will be seen very soon. Declan Green, whose play Moth, will be seen very soon. Vanessa Bates, whose play Every Second, will be seen very soon. All right, let the smackdown begin. I, I suggest keep your knees. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Um, we thought that we would just start by um, talking a little bit about um, something that's pointed out in the program but people may not be so aware of, which is some of the differences in the landscapes of the two countries in terms of theatre and art. And then, um, then we'll hear from the wonderful playwrights. Um, so Australia's population is 23 million, and the US's is 315 million. Um, uh, I just want to point out here that the federal arts money per capita in the United States is 46 cents per person, and in Australia it is $16 per person. Oh. So, <laughs> 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 I'm really going for that beer. <laughs> <laughs> Who's buying dinner as well? So having lived in both countries now, I can say that this makes a really big difference to the kind of landscape and to the way that artists are able to go about their work or the kind of partnerships that they make to do so. Um, some other interesting stats before uh, Todd speaks. Um, in 2012-13, in Australia, 57% of plays were written by men and 43% were written by women. In the United States, 70% 70 70 of plays were written by men and 20% were written by women. Um, Six percent in Australia were by Indigenous playwrights, um, and seven percent by playwrights from a non-English speaking background. In the United States, ten percent of plays were by ensembles, and twenty-one percent of plays were by playwrights of colour, and I, that means uh, produced plays and statistics collected. So I just thought that would give a little, um, little framing of some of the factors operating in the larger landscape before we hear from these wonderful about their own work. Great. Thank you. So, uh, just one thing, are we live streaming? Okay, because I don't feel very alive at this moment, it's kind of early. But just so everybody knows, that, uh, and we're gonna try and turn to everyone for a conversation uh, after the writers speak. Uh, so, um, within that framework that Christina's laid out, um, we, we want to talk less about the, um, uh, try and sum up our cultures, I think, uh, the way you do when you meet in a cafe in Paris when you're taking a trip in college and you meet someone from another country and you try and sum up your entire country in two beers or something like that. Um, we got six. Uh, or six. Or, uh, or well, two Four. are gone. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, then, then ask you guys to speak through your work about the, the particulars of um, your whatever you mean Americanism or Australianism or uh, uh, being an American playwright or an Australian playwright through the work. Um, you know, I was thinking to 20 years ago in this country and um, I, I was noting that um, uh, plays were very invested in place. So we had, within a couple years of each other, we had Angels in America, 
The America play by Susan Laurie Parks, The American Plan by Richard Greenberg, um, uh, the Kentucky Cycle. We had we were in the middle of August Wilson's Century Cycle, which was really about the American century. Twilight Los Angeles, 1992. You know that there was really an investment in place and thinking about how um, the prevalent sort of identity politics and gender conversations of the time um, really went towards um, uh, defining communities within America and that the conversation in a way has, has moved more towards race and gender than towards Americanness and what that meant and the sense of uh, what about your project is uh, not specifically or, or, or all about race and gender but really about n nationality or place. Um, so I think this is a little bit where I'm interested in going and Christine and I seem to be on the same page about this. Um, the only other thing I want to say is, um, before turning to uh, first to the American writers and then to the Australian writers, um, I was in uh, Boston at Arts Emerson, I guess it was last weekend or the weekend before, and uh, learned this great game. Uh, it's a kind of cultural mapping game, and uh, a woman named Obehi uh, Janis taught it, and she had learned it from Michael Road of Sojourn Theatre, and it's called Where I'm From, and it's like a... Um, it's a, it's a kind of musical chairs game where there's one space too few in the circle and the person who's stuck in the middle has to say something about the place that they come from um, and then the people who share that go into the middle with them and somebody gets the empty space in the ring, you know. So there were things like where I'm from, um, we refer to our elders as sir and madam and anybody who, you know, came from a place like that, or where I'm from, we wear bikinis in winter, <laughs> or where I'm from, um, the children are not allowed in the living room because it's covered with plastic. <laughs> <laughs> who shares that sort of cultural thing? So um, we're not going to do musical chairs unless you guys decide to do Smackdown, but, we, but this is a little bit about where I'm from in the most specific terms that you can. So uh, let's just start. Um, maybe I'll start with Carson, and we'll just move this way geographically. Um, uh, you know, the question is really a simple one. What about your work in specific do you see as part of being an American writer or as an American project? Um, we've asked everybody to talk for about three minutes so that we can sort of get that. And I will sort of gently do something like this about <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, And then maybe we'll we'll talk across, and then we'll talk around. Okay. So Carson, you want to start? Uh, sure. Well, that's what I get for sitting on the end. <laughs> 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 um, it's interesting. Yeah, I think I am. I consider myself more consciously uh, a citizen of my gender in America, but probably very unconsciously in, in everything I do, I am American. And it's it's probably just the, the edges I can't see. Um, I am I am definitely engaged in uh, filling in the gaps in recorded history or the history that we are taught, uh, which often is missing the interesting women. So I, I have been sort of play by play filling in the gaps of <coughs> the women that I wish I had known about growing up. Um, most recently, Lee Miller, who was uh, Man Ray's muse and with the Surrealists in Paris and became a World War II combat photographer. And I was so upset that I had never heard of her. <laughs> um, because she just lived her life so so bravely and in a way that men are allowed to and women generally aren't. Um, but I also, I definitely have more American plays. Uh, I have a play called The Love Song of J. Robert Oppenheimer about the atomic bomb um, that is also sort of about uh, re resonating the atomic bomb as Jewish. <laughs> Because again, the way it was taught to me in school was this very sort of abstract, um, we used the bomb against Japan, 
uh, and learning that it had really been created by um, Jews who mostly had fled from Germany to stop Hitler was a was a very different different thing. Uh, I also just recently wrote a play called uh, Flesh in the Desert, or recently produced, I've uh, been writing it for a while, about Las Vegas. And that one very much felt like a play about America, and a sort of uh, tender and exasperated play about America, and all of, all of our foolishness and headdresses, and just trying to make it work. <laughs> Uh, and um, Lasso of Truth that, uh, that we'll be reading on Saturday is um, I somehow keep coming back to the World War II era of working on just many, many plays that, that touch on that. And uh, this is about the man who invented both Wonder Woman and the lie detector machine. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Which is also is, is a sort of very... Um, American <laughs> striving for truth, truth and justice in the American way, and uh, and the little strangenesses around the corners. <laughs> so I, I think that that may be what I have to say about my Americanness. <laughs> it's I just before we move on to Jacqueline, I love that phrase to the edges I can't see. I think this is what we're getting at. Christine and I were talking this morning about and. And I, I don't want to paraphrase you, but you, you said something really moving about um, <clears throat> this sense of whether you, you can or cannot see the culture that you live in, the politics, the economics, and how they come to bear on you. If on you, you, you wanted to say I think I need more coffee before I Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jacqueline? Okay, yes. Um, so it's really interesting, this idea of being an American playwright. Um, I first actually went to Australia in 2002 as a part of the World Interplay, so these young artists, and I was um, with three other American playwrights, and I was told by these lovely Australian gentlemen, you always know when the Americans enter the room, they enter with such confidence, with their heads held high, and I just thought that was really quite interesting, um, this, I this identity. Um, so I was all 25 at that point, and I was very much a Texas-based um, playwright, so this idea of Texas is South meets West was sure determination and always the willingness to leave the country, um, which I very much was, <laughs> the country a lot. Um, but in terms of the work I do, the, the piece that I wrote for the, um, for the podcast plays for you all here takes us west, so that takes us past the FBI building, which how American can you get with that, with our own sense of national security. It takes us past the IRS, dear God help us all. And it takes us to Freedom Plaza, this um, marble concrete, honor to that which we fought for, which is um, freedom, and we continue to fight for our freedom every single day, it feels like. And you turn east, and you see the Capitol, yet again, and you're two blocks from the White House. My gosh, that, that's all these American um, symbols that are in the way. And so for me specifically as a writer, I'm a race-based and feminist conscious playwright, um, so I'm very much aware of roles for African American men and women, and also other people of color. I'm very interested in um, the race conversation that we have in this country. I'm more interested in the conversation that we don't have, the one that we're really terribly afraid of having. Currently, the play I have that's about to be produced at Theater J, The Hampton Years, is set in World War II, and I'm very interested in that time period. It's, it was a pinnacle moment in our nation's history for many, many reasons. We've gotten ourselves out of the Great Depression. Um, we stood firm on ground to fight for the freedom of the world. And uh, women left the home. This new definition of who women were that then changed who women could be, and it's still changing. We're still trying to understand the role of women in this country. Um, so that play, though, specifically is looking at the black and Jewish relationship, which is an ongoing, very tenuous, um, delicate um, relationship. And so that's what that play. Also looking at the role of artists, how are, um, and these are particular uh, visual artists, so there's sculptors and painters, muralists, what, um, how does gender, how does race allow or deny access into the building profession? That's something I'm very interested in. Um, a play that I wrote called Blood Bound and Tongue Tied, which was my first big play out of the Kennedy Center Playwrights Intensive. It looks at um, self-hatred within the African American community. So that specifically is looking at how this construct of beauty from an American perspective, be it um, television, magazines, 
what is beautiful defined nationally, how that impacts at other, other being whether you're a heavy set person, whether you're a person of color, pushing past exoticism, but what is that other, where does beauty lie? And so, so that's, and then oftentimes how internally a culture can turn in on itself and start to feed on itself, which happens a great deal in the African American community, and it comes to with um, skin color. So you have the paper brown bag test, which is to say if you're darker than um, a paper bag, you're not as beautiful as say if you're lighter than a paper bag, which I think is quite fascinating. Um, <laughs> and then with my play, The Devil's Sweetwater, it, it looks at Right after 9-11, there was this message to, if you see something, say something. So this idea of what happens if you, for me specifically, if you fell in love with the other, with, with the monster, with the, the terror in the room. So I adapted Faust and had a woman fall in love with a Muslim man who might or might not either save the world through curing cancer or a, a huge jihad. So, because I do love romance. <laughs> So at the core of my work as an American playwright in dialogue always with race and gender, I'm really trying, as um, Carson said, to look at these conversations that just that really aren't being had because there's fear in those conversations and I think that if we can at least start the dialogue, get in a room with people, then we can start making progress moving forward and I think art is such a beautiful way, I, I feel we all would agree that theater is such a beautiful way to be able to start that conversation. You guys are good at the three-minute thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Is it my turn? I guess so. All right. Uh, um, I, I actually think this question has uh, been at the center of my work for the last 10 years, uh, uh, what it means to be an American. I think that partly comes from how I grew up. Uh, I'm the child of immigrants. My father was born in Colombia. My mom was born in Puerto Rico. And, uh, and I grew up in the suburbs in New York um, in a very kind of middle class assimilated lifestyle. Uh, so throughout my entire life I've always felt like, well, I have some connection to my parents' culture, but then I also, you know, listen to the Ramones and, <laughs> and, that's, and where that sort of fits in for me has always been uh, an operative question. And I think the, it really crystallized with me in relation to my work uh, in 2003. I had this uh, grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to basically travel around the United States and, um, and the rule of that particular trip is we couldn't ride on the interstate highways, we could only ride on the secondary roads. Uh, and as a, a lifelong East Coaster, I live in Chicago now, um, uh, and I had just moved to Chicago when, uh, when this grant happened. Uh, uh, you know, when you live on the coast, you know, there's, uh, there's this place you fly over, which is the rest of the country, <laughs> um, and uh, you don't really pay attention to like the little uh, nuts and bolts that uh, make up the whole picture. Uh, and that trip was really amazing. We spent um, we spent you know seven weeks uh, traveling you know thirteen thousand miles uh, in pretty much every region in the country. And the kind of lesson I gleaned from that is that uh, we live in this kind of insane work in progress that shouldn't work and should have destroyed itself and has destroyed itself in the past and rebuilds itself and recreates itself and uh, uh, and you know and then I found myself in very strange situations. Well, why am I more comfortable? Why do I feel more myself? in this weird bar outside of Memphis than I do in New York City or anywhere else? Uh, uh, or why do I feel really, uh, really uh, uh, alive in this little town in Nevada where I'm meeting these weird collectors uh, who collect artifacts and mines and that sort of thing? Um, uh, and, uh, and so to, that really sort of sparked uh, my imagination, you know, since then. And um, really asking that question, well, what, what, like, what does that, like, what is American identity? And having grown up in that area you're talking about, when, you know, when uh, the sort of, um, how, how did you describe it, the uh, uh, sort of pockets of identity kind of speaking, as opposed to a larger American picture, having grown up in that era and you know, uh, beginning writing in that era, I thought the sort of next project was to really ask that bigger question. Well, we all, we all do uh, uh, possess these uh, separate identities, but what really links us together, what really, um, uh, what's the uh, what's the what's the uh, kind of glue that holds this bizarre fabric together? Because um, uh, it's really astonishing when you go to these places and uh, it drives my wife crazy any time we're down a road trip. I'm like, go see the ball of yarn and you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, go to these really bizarre places. Uh, uh, I find those really enriching, and, and it's informed my work. Uh, uh, the play you're going to see this afternoon is a uh, kind of uh, there's a character that doesn't actually appear in it, but is sort of central to the entire play. He's really sort of like a demented version of myself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, he's asking that question, and he's sort of the author of several of my plays. Um, uh, this guy named Javier C. And I think the most kind of crystallized example of, uh, of where some of these ideas come together is a recent play by called A Thick Description of Harry Smith, which is about um, 
Harry Everett Smith, who was the musicologist. He, uh, his most well-known uh, uh, work was the Anthology of American Folk Music, which came out in 1952. But he was also a painter, and he was a, 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 an occultist, and he was part of, he was sort of like a lettered zelig of the kind of 1950s and 60s bohemian scene in New York. Everybody knew him, but nobody knows him. Uh, and uh, um, so I created this piece, which is really like this uh, kind of, I wanted it to be kind of like a road trip through the United States using some of the music from the anthology with lyri new lyrics, telling his story as a kind of, um, uh, as a sort of underground denizen who shaped uh, the culture in a lot of ways, and, and trying to be um, really optimistic, because I think there's a lot of, uh, certainly in the last decade, there's been a lot of negativity about the idea of being American, uh, uh, certainly from the last administration and, uh, and some of the conversations that we've been having in the last election. And, uh, and I kind of, I kind of want to find a way to celebrate what it, you know the idea of being American that we are this kind of weird, warty, uh, monstrous beast uh, that um, that uh, is constantly readjusting itself and trying to find what what it is, what it means. Um, uh, so anyway, so the, that particular piece uh, I, I describe as a uh, proto psychedelic prairie home companion, uh, which, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and it tries to capture some of that spirit. So uh, uh, that's certainly a big preoccupation. And, um, uh, uh, and the current play I'm working on, which I'm going up to New York in two days to work on, uh, deals with some of the same questions. So. Fabulous. Um, it's, you know, it's so interesting to hear um, all of these wonderful stories and the kind of specificity of the, the angles. Um, there's one thing that comes to mind, you know, especially listening, Jackie, to what you're saying about um, the tour and about this idea of freedom and American freedom. Um, I just want to share one little anecdote that I think may connect into um, the Australian stories that we're going to hear. Um, I, live, I first moved here in 2001 and I was here <coughs> for the hanging chads and the election of the <laughs> of George Bush and, um, and uh, September 11th happened but I'd only been here a short time and the thing that really struck me after that day, walking around the streets and in those first days of complete shock in the country was that I heard the word freedom everywhere. And I really didn't understand it as an Australian. I felt as though in that moment I, I saw this kind of hidden side of the country in the sense of what is the, the gut value that comes out under pressure. And the response was, I just heard this word freedom all the time. And I was wandering around thinking, what would happen in Australia if something really terrible happened and people articulated the sort of gut core value of the country? And you know, you may have a really different feeling about this, but for me, it was the idea of the fair go. Mm -hmm. You know, that feels mm -hmm. like the absolute core value that is ideologically embedded in the Australian mind. It's not freedom mm -hmm. in the same way at all. Um, but this idea that everyone should have a fair go, that people should be made. And of course, this has its underbelly, which is that if you're too good at something, you're stepping out of line. You know, yeah. That is the tall poppy syndrome in Australia. But that it was just one of those really raw moments in this country that suggested to me that this, the core felt value that meant being Australian was different than the core felt value that meant being American. So um, I just offer that in a late response to your question. Um, and As a caffeinated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to first turn to Declan and would love to hear about your work and how it relates to where you come from. Sure. Um, I think for me, um, most of my work is really kind of concerned with um, with culture and kind of mass cultural dissemination and the way it actually arrives on Australian soil. So I think my work is kind of deeply about Australia in the sense that it's actually not about Australia at all. And it's about Australia as a magpie culture and an extremely young country and a country uh, whose sense of national identity is a very warped and strange pastiche of other, of, of other cultures. I don't feel like, um, even this the sense of kind of you know, the fair go, I think, is a very kind of splintered and fractious idea. It's, a, it's an idea which is kind of reiterated constantly in our national psyche, but at the same time is at, at complete odds with the massive human rights disgraces that are occurring in our country as we speak. We're a country where we incarcerate the people who turn up on our shores seeking a fair go from overseas, escaping persecution, and put them in detention centres in the desert. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a real disgrace. And... Um, so in a sense, I think that that shame is kind of at the core, <laughs> kind of at the core of my work as well. 
that said, I'm also you know very passionate about my country and, and, I, and I love my country, but it's a very it's a very kind of um it's a difficult love hate relationship, and I think that's something that's kind of and I'm sure that's something that's kind of keenly <laughs> felt for a lot of artists. You know. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, my kind of the majority of the work I I, I kind of create is um. On one hand, I, I'm, I'm kind of really interested in uh, in creating work that's uh, it's very very kind of localized work that kind of embraces theatre as uh, as you know something which is resistant to mass production. And so I'm kind of uh, in in terms of the work I create in in my hometown, which is Melbourne, um, uh, in Victoria. Um, it's uh, it's very much about kind of looking around at the resources I have on hand, which might be um, which. Uh, which will be not necessarily actors, which might be kind of um, uh, people who are my friends from the queer community, people who are kind of like strippers or drag queens or, um, or uh, kind of MCs or party hosts or DJs, and um, then kind of getting them to enact uh, narratives which are appropriated from other cultures. And uh, actually, this sort of invariably tends to be, these tend to be American narratives because um, this is kind of the country with the greatest kind of um, uh, influence, I think, on the development of Australian national identity. So um, I did a work recently, which was about um, kind of taking the great American Civil War epic, um, <laughs> so the idea of like Gone with the Wind, and staging that in a garage in the suburbs of Australia with the cast of drag queens <laughs> um, in crinolines. <laughs> um, so kind of, um, I guess, yeah, in a sense, that's kind of about kind of uh, yeah, thinking about the way that. Um, it, yeah, we, we kind of we kind of structure ourselves in relation to this um, kind of constant downward pressure from other cultures, um, and uh, and then next year, um, and that's kind of with this theatre company I run, I run called Sisters Grimm, and um, and uh, and we've 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 made about five shows now, and I think they all have been uh, kind of our, our cast of um, non-performers kind of struggling with American accents to some degree. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> tragically, tragically, tragic, but yeah, tragically failing. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of like, with, with this theatre company, we're kind of really interested in creating kind of um, kind of a very, very messy kind of live experiences that even where, where the, the play text is not kind of a sacrosanct thing, it's something that kind of shifts constantly. And that's why we try and work with non-performers, like people who are comfortable in front of a crowd and will kind of uh, roll with um, roofs falling in and, um, and neighbours <laughs> screaming at us to be quiet. And um, the kind of a sense, well, yeah, we're, we're a queer theatre company and I think our kind of our interest is kind of in about thinking about uh, queer theatre in Australia and thinking about um, uh, queer narratives and uh, a queer narratives not in the sense of kind of uh, the queer narratives that find their way onto the main Australian main stage, which are invariably um, narratives where kind of the gay or queer community are structured as, you know, uh, embroiled in conversations about gay marriage, or um, or you know, invariably structured as kind of a pedophilic influence, or or, or struggling with uh, HIV or AIDS, but actually thinking about queer as a dislocating social force, uh, something which can kind of uh, disrupt the kind of the um, I guess white heterocentric narratives that uh, are at the core of our cultural identity, and um, we yeah do that by putting drag queens in dresses and making them talk in American accents. <laughs> <laughs> um, the play I'm presenting at the festival has nothing to do with any of this. Okay, so um, it's, it's really interesting hearing you guys talk about the kinds of work that you do and the subjects that you're interested in. And at first I was thinking, Look, I don't think my work is really, um, you know, I don't think it really says something about, you know, Australia or about being Australian, but Australian. But then, when I kind of thought about it, I thought, well, I I come from a kind of non, like out of the um, out of the city, so not Sydney, not Melbourne, and bizarrely, there are actually more places in Australia than just those two cities. <laughs> yes. um, so, uh, so, but I. Um, I spent a lot of time in, in kind of regional areas and um, the first play I wrote, uh, Darling Oscar, that, that kind of, you know, got out there was a play about a girl uh, with a mother um, not dissimilar to a character that, that we saw last night in a reading, a character with large hair. Um, so, but her, th this girl um, 
it gives birth to a fish and and it's and it was all about you know that whole thing of leaving the family le, le, you know getting out and i think when i think back on that i think on oh, that so it's so of that time and me leaving you know getting out again one of those sorts of plays and and also being not in the kind of you know in the center of things not in the city you know um, so i think regional you know being not city being regional has, has actually played quite a lot of a part in my writing um, the plays that i'm writing there's always been a gender thing, so I've always been attracted to these kind of female characters and and also families um, and and mothers and daughters and and the plays that I've, I've just written recently, uh, Porn Cake and Every Second, which is on um, here, um, are about are now about relationships between um, people of my age and they're about long-term relationships and they're kind of small kind of um, these really tiny little mysteries that happen within those relationships and how they um, impact upon people. Um, where, and in terms of the regionalism in those plays, I think um, it's probably, it's, I think it's about people missing out and feeling like they've missed out, either missed out on, you know, the most important moment of their life somehow. Um, or, or missing out on, you know, what the potential that was always there for them, you know. So, um, gee, that makes me feel really sad about myself. <laughs> <laughs> sad person. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I have to say. I'm going to wallow in that. <laughs> reminded again why I love playwrights. Um, uh, I, I'm wondering about the questions you have for each other, actually. Um, uh, but while you <coughs> think about that, I, I'm just, um, I, I'm struck by this notion of gut value or core value, you know, and wh whether it is this sense of fair go or freedom or, uh, and how it's articulated in so many different ways. Um, I, I, it makes me wonder, and this is maybe a terrible question because it's so general, um, it makes me wonder if in a way as artists you aren't um, always finding a way to actually assert the real value inside the stated value of your culture, you know? Like what freedom really is in, in a um, complicated and contradictory America, what fairness really is in a place that detains its immigrants or, you know, um, uh, and if there isn't that, um, that sense of, that the opposition of you as artists to your, to the, do either the dominant culture you live in or the dominance of other cultures that <coughs> come to you isn't in some ways to assert whether it's in a, in a um, more domestic or a more um, uh, in, in, in a more you know social realm, um, the truth inside the stated value. That I don't know if that's a question or just amusing <laughs> or if you want to pick it up or not. But what I'm uh, really actually more interested in is what you think of what you each other said, what you might ask in relation to what you each other said. Mm -hmm. I have to say, uh, yeah, I love the, this notion of the fair, the fair go, and that does seem so alien to mm -hmm. the way we run things around. Here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I uh, something something I uh, should have mentioned in in the work I do with its Americanness is I um, am very attracted to female antiheroes, mm -hmm. which I think is just a, a basic right of male characters to be unattractive and make bad choices and hurt people, and women are not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> so that sort of felt like desiring a fair go. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that, but that notion of freedom and the individual and individual rights right. And the Vergo, I think, has, has led me to write 
uh, three plays about women who kill. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, what would the woman admirable. Harry Smith be? But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. but it's something <laughs> that we should be able to speak about. And it's, it is something that is often admired in men, and it is absolutely verboten in women. I think it's interesting that quite a few of the plays that you guys have talked about um, are kind of, you know, a, a character that's within them, or maybe more, is actually a real person. Is, would that be right? Like it's a, it's like a, not, it's about history. Like, yeah, it's, it's come from history. It's come from actual history. Yeah, most of my plays are based on real, real people. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think this, the one I'm writing now is the, the Hampton Years, but, oh, and actually, Armin Mervis now, they're both not real people. But traditionally, I don't write about real yeah. people. Yeah. yeah, do you guys have that sense? I mean, partly what that is to me, what I hear is this sense of unwritten history, writing yeah. unwritten mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I guess we're both fairly young cultures. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, I think when I when I find myself drawn to historical figures, um, there's something about them that embody uh, all the complexity of America. So Harry Smith, to me, he's sort of unwritten, and you know, in underground circles, he's sort of worshipped. But there's something about um, uh, the contradictions within that person that embody. The whole idea of America for me, mm -hmm. uh, both the and you use a great phrase, you know, things to be ashamed about, things to be, you know, proud of, mm -hmm. uh, and they're all kind of wrapped up in this particular individual. So, uh, and uh, my new play, there's also a, a, another minor unknown figure who um, seems to embody these things. And I guess I don't know. I think that's that's uh, uh, you know, I think of films like Citizen Kane, you know, where there's the kind of iconic American as as, as the central central figure in, 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 uh, in the storytelling. I don't know what, what there is to that. But I, I'm interested in this idea of, of uh, just to switch a little bit, but the uh, fair go freedom. I think if you sort of hold uh, Americans both from the right and left uh, about the idea of freedom, uh, certainly people on the right would say that, oh, that is the fair go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that everybody's out for themselves, and if you're successful, great. Uh, and then other people would define freedom uh, on the left-hand <coughs> side of the spectrum that Fergo needs to be part of freedom in order to achieve. So uh, it's, uh, it's just interesting the way those two ideas uh, resonate. Had any of you ever heard that phrase? Fergo no. Before? You had yeah. ten minutes. When you were talking about it, I think it's just talking about all the time. We all say there's something interesting to what you're saying. Um, this idea of, of um, artists speaking to so there's a notion of freedom. There's a notion of Fergo, and then there's what everyday people are actually living and experiencing, and which oftentimes is very different from what that national conversation is, from the, the lovely writ that's at large. And I remember two years ago, um, Washington Post critic, sometimes lives in New York, I think now he's in New York, Peter Marks was asking about the DC playwright's voice. So there's always this desire to define the DC playwright's voice, and we're all individually fighting this question, and we're not wanting to be defined. <laughs> and the, what he was getting behind is this idea of we're in the nation's capital. You know, I live seven blocks from from the capital, from the Supreme Court, and we're not really writing about politics. We're not really writing about the things, and I don't know if there is a grand desire to, because we see it played out right in front of us all the time. But what I think is really compelling is I, I, would, I do adhere to the charge of artists speaking to what actually is happening, speaking to what is the truth to dispel that national myth. I think that that's really important because it is giving voice to people who aren't allowed, who don't get that national platform to say this is how it is, this is what's going, so this is what we accept, when in fact that's just quite simply not, not the case. So I think it's, it's really interesting. And to speak to this idea of um, real people, this play, Our Man Beverly Snow, is about this um, free, free person of color and his restaurant was actually at 601 Pennsylvania Avenue, so just a block around here. And it was in 1835 and there's this race riot and um, he was actually, uh, his restaurant, he snuck out and got away, but his restaurant was attacked and he was attacked because he was a free man of color at a time when free people outnumbered slaves for the first time in DC's history and he was successful. Mm -hmm. And um, the large white community, which was very poor at that time, was enraged that this that this free man's color became successful. And I decided to write it because I see that echoed in what's happening with President Obama. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I just wanted to show that. 
<laughs> but this raises a question for me. Do you know what, what is our time? Are we We're doing really well, actually. Eleven thirty. Yeah. Oh, great. So we'll yeah. have so, lots of time for yeah. questions. So start thinking what you want to ask too. Um, so I have a question for you guys. You know, Jackie, what Jackie said about being a DC playwright. There, there has been a mm -hmm. century-long conversation in America, um, more than a century, about um, local playwriting, uh, rural playwriting, local playwriting, as opposed to by coastal or, or, mm -hmm. or uh, metropolitan playwriting. And I was talking to some of our friends from um, Bo uh, Buffalo last night, and they're talking about cultivating um, the local Buffalo playwriting community and so on. Um, and so, there, you know, th this thing about what does it mean to write from outside of Melbourne or S Sydney? Um, what does it mean to write from Melbourne or not Sydney? Or where do you come from? Th this notion of where I come from being important to my voice as opposed to having a national voice or this sense that, oh, you're a New York playwright, therefore you speak for America in some way. Is there, um, is there a, a conversation around locality, ruralness, a uh, specific place in Australian playwriting? I think that one of the kind of main conversations that's occurring at the moment is actually about, uh, particularly in, in, in Australian playwriting culture, is, um, is actually just about uh, a kind of larger shift that's occurring away from a playwright-driven theatre. I think we're moving towards being a Reggie theatre culture where um, it's um, completely director-led. And actually, um, the role I think a lot of playwrights are being um, uh, kind of moving towards now is kind of being uh, uh, put in this position of kind of like adapting canonical texts for um, and, and actually trying to locate a, 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 a very kind of uh, specific um, voice um, you know that, that's Australian and and um, speaks to the local audience from from your city or the theatre you're writing for um, uh, in, in kind of relation to a, a much older canonical text, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of interesting and kind of again like feeds into this idea of Australia as a pirate culture again, <laughs> still <laughs> trying to actually trying to locate our identity um, um, through the stories of other cultures, and um, and and I think that what's kind of interesting especially is that like you know we have. Uh, the kind of, the kind of viewers, the, the audiences who come to, to the theatres in um, in uh, in the kind of major city centres in Australia are kind of by and large white middle class over the age of you know forty, and um and that if you're adapting a text, a canonical text to make it relevant for this audience, you end up adapting it specifically for these audiences and for these people. There was a um, a production of um, Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman that um, just went on to kind of great. Uh, hype and acclaim in um, in in Melbourne in Australia, um, which was done um, completely in Australian accent, where they um uh, and where they completely stripped of the set and just had a car sitting on stage and it all it was the, all the action just kind of uh, hovered around a car, and um and this action of kind of adaptation was kind of like really massively controversial. Firstly, because I mean it was it was all almost um, embarrassing. Like I, I went to see it and I was I thought I thought it was an incredible piece of theatre. At the same time, I was like it's incredible that they kind of. Um, values of the 1950s. Yeah, 1950s American can still kind of speak to Australia in this <laughs> way that's almost perverse. <laughs> like, um, you know, but then also that the um, uh, that the director kind of cut out the final monologue and then um, then got a massive bitch slap from the estate of Arthur Miller. <laughs> yeah, it was hugely controversial and kind of hard. And um, but yeah, the, the, the same theatre company kind of um, uh, did a version of um, Ibsen's The Wild Duck. Where um, it was um, set kind of behind a glass box, and this, the text had just been rewritten to make it about kind of uh, yeah white middle class people that you might see on television, and it was kind of behind a glass wall, which kind of made it all more about white people that you might see on the television. <laughs> 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 it's just um, I, I, anyway. So sorry, that's a very round, long and roundabout way of saying that I think that um, the Australian um, local identity on the on the main stage um, tends to be about. Um, white middle class people in urban centres and th those are the voices that are articulated by playwrights and I think it's kind of a problematic thing. So it's a, it's a kind of self-reflecting thing that the audience is, the work is written for and to the audience. Absolutely. And, and it becomes a close system. Yeah, I think it's very close system. What about for you? Well, I, I, th I mean, I think that's true, what Declan's saying, but I think that there are other kinds of plays that are being done <coughs> as well and other kinds of... Um, other kinds of work, you know, that's less text-based and you know more more performance-based and that sort of thing. Um, the, I, don't, I mean, you know, 
there, there are plays that I've written that are that I think now you know they are kind of middle class kind of plays I guess but I don't I don't think of them that way and I don't think like you know like I'm Eurasian and I you know I don't think I'm writing a <coughs> white play you know um, I'm just writing a story about these people that you know this thing happens to them um, but. What, yeah. Where, where you said that you didn't come from Sydney or Melbourne. What's the place you come from? Uh, well, I would say probably Newcastle, which is a couple of hours north of um, of Sydney. And um, and I, I mean, I've lived in Sydney for a long time. I've actually just moved back to Newcastle. Um, and so, but being from Newcastle, you know, being not from Sydney, and Sydney being the major uh, centre that was kind of nearby, but you know, obviously I, I'm not from there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say I get a massive chip on my shoulder, or that the people do, but I think there is something about that. There's something about, and it's this fair go idea. I think comes into that. It's about feeling excluded, you know, and exclusion. I think, I think playwrights do feel very strongly about um, exclusion, you know, for whatever reason, or you know, yeah. Do you feel any? Um need to represent for Newcastle or that your your source material Well do you know I, I have I've written a play that um, that was about um, it was about that that siege uh, in Moscow uh, when the when the um, you know the Chechens took over the theater and on the weekend that that was resolved in Australia in Newcastle um, a young guy tried to hold up a bookshop uh, with a son off shotgun and um, so there were two newspaper articles that I was kind of looking at and it was just interesting that in both stories there was this young, aggressive, you know, uh, young man out armed and an older woman who tried to negotiate with them and in one, um, you know, all happening on the same weekend but, you know, on different parts of the world and, and in one story it ended really badly and in another story it actually ended okay, you know, it was all right. So, and I kind of wove them through. Um, What's the name of that paper? That's a uh, checklist for an armed robber. And the, <laughs> um, and, and the thing with the, um, the new, the interest, like the, that play is being done over and over again in Australia. Loads of, um, you know, loads of, uh, like universities and drama courses are doing them now, doing it now, but, um, it's never been done in Newcastle, <laughs> <laughs> and there, you know there are theatres there, but it, it's just sort of I, don't, I mean I don't know why that is. I haven't pushed that, but I, I just think that's a really interesting kind of thing. And and the plays that are being done there are not um, often often not Australian plays, you know. And I was really excited because they did a the one of the local theatre companies did an Australian play just recently. And I, you know, yay! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wasn't mine. <laughs> 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 yeah. mm. So, I, I have a question. Just kind of, this is very stimulating for me, feeling my bipolar relationship <laughs> to my other countries. Um, one of the things that um, <coughs> that strikes me about coming from Australia and hearing you speak especially, Declan, what you're saying about the shards of American culture that are reflecting everywhere, that there's a difference between the two countries that is that Australia is always within the shadow of American power. And America is almost singular in the world in being a country where you can live in America and only think about the country you're in. There's very, very few other, at least Anglo-centric countries, where that's even a possibility because everywhere else, is within the radiance or the shadow of American mass culture, which is increasingly global culture. So that, and it's the other thing about Australia too is that it's an Anglophone nation, a very multicultural Anglophone nation, on Indigenous land mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. I mean, Australia mm -hmm. is geographically in, you know, uh, there's um, Indonesia and East Timor <coughs> and Thailand mm -hmm. and Japan and India. We're much <coughs> more. We, where am I? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> much more in that part of the world. Yeah. And so, so this Australian idea of identity and country is really complicated by, mm. by being in place and out of place 
you know, an Australian identity is always in dialogue with other countries and displaced geographies. Mm. You know, one of the things that's really struck me about coming to the States is this sense of the mirror ball that mm. this this constant thinking about America and what is America um, <coughs> is somehow not always oriented to the fact that America casts big shadows in other places. You know, mm. so this is this. this so they're, too, they're sort of, it's sort of like being inside of a mirror ball with all the mirrors shining inwards, or being outside of a mirror ball with a lot of light getting in your eyes in some way. So I wonder if anyone could speak to the complexity of place that that generates in either place, because I think it, I think you know it does have complexities. <coughs> In, in I think that, I think it, with Australian playwriting, there was a period of time, not very long ago, where it was really kind of frowned on to do a play about being Australian, or you know, it, it was. I remember a, a director saying to me, "Oh God, you know, another Billabong play," <laughs> you know. So um, and and because you know, and you know, getting then to the you know that tricky subject of plays actually getting on. If a play doesn't get performed, you know. Does it exist really? It's mm -hmm. it's on paper in your desk drawer, you know. And um, <laughs> so if you're kind of worrying about who's going to produce your play, um, and they don't want to see a Billabong play, then you you may you may not write it, you what know. Could you define what? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> Billabong is like a little tract of water, the, the jolly swag man. What's the what's the Matilda? <laughs> it's good you're going to hold yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it's just a kind of. Vanessa. You can say, yes, Rick. Uh, the, the other thing, too, that, may, that maybe Americans would be interested in knowing is the concept of the cultural cringe, yes. which yes. is very yes. pervasive in Australia and still exists, which you guys are sort of talking about. And the cultural cringe is sort of a, a unique embarrassment of one's own culture that yeah. still. Uh, exists a lot in Australia and what Declan was talking about about our little uh, uh, kind of um, uh, new tradition of producing of adapting old classics is sort of a bit of the cultural cringe in, a in action we're far more comfortable at taking other works and trying to find ourselves in them rather than defining ourselves or championing new stories to be told actually I think really interesting like, about that idea, or whether you feel cringe at all towards your own culture, or, or oh, kind of oh, aspect. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> about, about American narratives and stuff like that, like, like not necessarily about the kind of like your know, heart and just in the uh, freedom thing, but just more about kind of like your, the, the, the narratives that define your, <laughs> your culture. I will say, I had an American cringe moment when I was actually in Belgrade. So this was in 2002, and I was teaching at this embassy because a friend of mine was working there, and. Belgrade, you know, they were going through, in 2002, they were going through a really huge transition. This was after Milosevic was ousted, and so they were really coming into their own. And so I was there, and I was watching television, and oh my gosh. So they're very nationalist, which I love, and I think it's really tremendous, because I, I love that. When I go away, I want to go away. On television was The Simpsons and Friends, but it was in Serbsky. Mm -hmm. So, and I thought... Well, if you have to have, if, if, of all the American television shows to bring over, I had it not to denounce The Simpsons or Friends product placement, but it was just quite something. I was like, of all the things that could have been transported to this little place, mm -hmm. going through this huge transition, how fascinating that it's these two pop pop culture shows. But thank goodness it was in Serbsky, so it hadn't. America hadn't completely mm -hmm. taken over. So I had a little. I had a <coughs> But there's there. also a kind of automatic legitimacy when British companies come to yeah. the United States, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, we and get that too. the Brooklyn oh, yeah. Academy of Music, some British company comes and it's uh, automatically comes with a stamp of approval, regardless of oh, the quality of the stuff. I mean, it was fascinating to hear that Australia seems to feel more in dialogue with America than with England. Mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. think well, that would be it, um, and I think because we still have this weird... <laughs> But it's true of the whole world, it's isn't it? But it's it's yeah. Christine's point that we're the only ones who don't see other countries and influences. I was just going to say, but, it, hmm. but and and is that Australian society <clears throat> that feels like that, or the Australian theatre society that feels <clears throat> like that? You know, because I would say in Australian theatre society that the, the the UK and their works are. 
you know, <coughs> at, I think at least as, you know, um, this, I'm jet lagged, okay? And this <laughs> carpet is, is really, it's doing that to me. <laughs> 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 thing, this, yeah. the, this is the UK and this is the US, so that's, an, mm. that's kind of even hands. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. With, with theatre. Yeah, with theatre, yeah. 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 I wonder if there's something about the two countries being born out of uh, exile communities. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Having some connection. Uh, I mean, they're both kind of constructs, you know, mm -hmm. these vast lands that were populated by an original population that, uh, uh, which I think, I think feeds into a lot of the, you know, the shame we feel or the kind of uh, ambivalence we feel about our history. Um, uh, that we sort of grafted, uh, 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 and it's hard to talk about American identity at, because I don't think it's a fixed thing. I think it's such a complicated thing, and it's you know, and like I said, you know, this trip that I took, being in urban centers is a totally different experience than being out in the middle of nowhere, uh, and and how we define that. But that sense of uh, no one is from here except the original peoples who were here, and they're not many of them, mm. but, you know. Uh, so I wonder how that translates into the. Uh, uh, into the thinking there, and, and if that influences you guys, or, uh, yeah. yeah. I sometimes think that, um, the, the <coughs> cultural cringe is kind of about um, a very specific set of Australian frontier narratives, and, um, and, and about, like, even that kind of thing about the billabong, or the, the kind of the jumbuck, or waltzing Matilda, and stuff like that, for me, these are, um, these are kind of uh, ideas or motives that are really deeply entrenched in um, colonialism. And I think that even in a kind of, in, maybe in, in an intuitive sense, sometimes I feel that cultural cringe and a kind of, uh, I get when I hear Waltzing Matilda or what I, when I hear somebody talk to me about, you know, Australians riding around in the, um, you know, in, in wallabies or something like that, or <laughs> wrestling crocodiles, or, or just that sense of like the struggle against the land. Yeah. For me, that, that is actually, yeah, these are motifs of colonialism and are about kind of the core of terror and genocide at the, yeah. at the very, very kind of, you know, uh, the foundations of our culture. And the, yeah, but sometimes I think that that's kind of that's where that <coughs> does come from. That it's actually a really knee-jerk and voluntary kind of disgust about the kind of the the way we came to inhabit our country. Mm -hmm. I think um, these th these are such huge topics, and I hope that we can kind of continue them all weekend. I mean, one of the things that we haven't touched on, but would be great to talk about over the weekend, is the the is indigenous theatre in Australia yes. and the the strong kind of rise of that the, the last. 20 years, I guess. Um, but now we need to make some time for our audience to be in conversation with our highlights. Anybody <coughs> have anything to say, ask? Yes. Well, um, you, we started Just off. Just identify yourself, okay? Oh, hi, my name is Jamil Jude. I'm the NNPN producer in residence at Mixed Blood Theatre. Jason made me say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you started out by quoting statistics comparing, uh, you know, the U.S. and how we fund and produce plays. I'm interested, especially here, uh, about new play development uh, in Australia and how and how that compares to the American style of uh, new play development. I think you know we're here to champion um, the best practices of the new play field. So I'm wondering if there are things that we can learn, um, you know, from you all, and just talk to your experiences and how how do you all get to the point where you're almost at 50/50 equity when we're still like 70/20, right? Like so, um, what are things that we can talk about as far as development, new play development, and then also. Um, more specifically for me, as new play production, how can we get in? Uh, how can we get towards that equity? So that may not be, more, you know, a five-minute question, but I'd Dan, do you want to weigh in on that? Well, um, it was interesting when Jason came to to Perth and talked um, about the, the rolling the rolling premiere. Can't hear you. Can you speak a little louder? Okay. Thanks. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, um, it was interesting when Jason came to. Um, Perth, uh, sorry, Perth, Melbourne, to talk about the, the rolling premiere program because I think the key issue for playwrights in, in Australia is um, is that sense of getting a production past its first production and, and having the opportunity to, to reflect on the work and work with more than one company on on uh, on that work. Um, and when Jason explained the model, there was a lot of excitement within the, the theatre community because it was something that um, was a practical um, so solution to a problem that's been um, that we've been grappling with. Equally, one of the one of the 
Another problem is the idea of emerging playwrights. Um, there's a lot, lot of support for, for, for younger writers. Um, in my other capacity, um, for another organisation, I, I, I run a, a, an emerging playwrights program. Um, and there are a number of mentorship programs for, for, um, for younger writers offered by the Australia Council and other organisations. Um, but there's a kind of a point where you've, you've gone through that and you've had your, probably you've had your first production. Um, but then where do you go from there? And certainly uh, I know that um, even established playwrights, when they've had a, a considerable success with uh, uh, a new work, so for, for example, um, um, Vanessa's had a big <coughs> hit last, this year with a production called Porn Cake. Um, once that success has, has been had, um, it's almost like people move on um, and are looking for the next <laughs> thing. Again, the exclusion. <laughs> Not just Vanessa. Not just me. Yeah, so, so I mean, it, it does seem that, that um, as, Je as I was saying, when Jason was talking to us in, in, in Melbourne, that structural issues are, 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 were facing quite similar structural issues. You also, though, and I'll just quickly to tack on, uh, <coughs> something. a lot of the companies that specialize in doing new plays, uh, there's a, a certain kind of uh, territorialism about it because there's ability to tour those plays mm -hmm. and fill the mm -hmm. coffers of those theater, of, for those theater companies. So nothing against like the Belvoir, which is a really fantastic theater in Sydney, but they'll produce a new play and it'll go to X theater in Melbourne and X theater in Perth and X theater in you know all around the country. So there's a, a, with the same cast, with the same you know. It, it, so it's a more of a touring model like the UK than anything we have here. And then the other thing that I think is hugely different about new play development to to Jamil's question, I, I, I like to say that PWA Playwriting Australia and New Dramatists are occupy similar places in their respective cultural landscape, but PWA is funded by the government. The gov you have a brief from the government to develop playwrights in Australia. And so there is, I mean, it's not like you have a giant budget, but you are given a budget from the Australia Council to go to every city, every territory in Australia to develop those playwrights, to do that, to do that. There's no, whereas our play development systems in this country are highly regionalized, highly based on where you can get funding. There's you know, government funding. The government has no... Only local governments, if anything, and state governments have any interest in making sure that playwrights are supported and that playwriting as a cultural form remains vibrant. I'm just wondering, do we think that that, because I, uh, my, um, I have a friend who uh, is in, I, I'm sorry, I'm Bridget, uh, Bridget O'Leary from Boston. Um, I, I have a friend from Canada who talks a lot about, and I don't know if this is still true, but at least six years ago, that uh, Canada was investing a lot in its artists, but mostly in the exporting of the artists, and that there was incentive to produce, if you were in Canada, to produce Canadian playwrights. Right. I know we don't do that in America, but I wonder if it has anything to do with what we're talking about, this idea that we feel like we have our solid identity, and that is very easily getting out there into the world if governments um, of countries that maybe don't feel that they have such an, uh, a, a global presence Need in some way to incentivize that getting getting um, that out there. Um, I mean, certainly that I mean, in our conversation. I mean, you, there's an international programs manager. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're at a very important senior position at PWA uh, that is all about getting that out. Um, the lark, uh, the lark here in the United States. Well, it's really more about bringing people in. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell very briefly the story of when I was talking about the Rolling World premieres uh, and Chris Mead, the former artistic director, the former Todd London at PWA, he was explaining an NPN and this exchange and there was a whole, I won't go into all of the details because it will uh, be embarrassing, but there was a lot of debate within, within an NPN at the senior levels about whether we should do an international exchange with a national new play network. Why are we possibly bringing in and supporting international playwrights? Uh, and Chris Mead, as he's introducing me, saying, we're so lucky to have Jason here from an NPN. They're very nervous about the Australians possibly taking over. <laughs> the so this is, you know, <laughs> 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 Identify, please. 
even uh, Seth, Seth Rosen with Interact Theater Company of Philadelphia. Um, curious to know about the relationship between the new play industry in Australia and the media, and particularly reviews and the relationship to the major metropolitan centers. Because in this country, one of the things that we face still, even in our own, you know, our midst of, our, of the NNPN, is that the New York Times is the de facto artistic director for hmm. much of the country, or for most of the country, really, I'd say, in that if the Times gives a good review, that play has a better chance of getting produced everywhere, regardless of what the theater's mission is and regardless of what community they're in. Uh, and is that is there anything similar to, to that in uh, Australia? I certainly hope not. I woke up this morning to find my play got a one-star review from um, <laughs> <laughs> it's from the it's from the major right-wing tabloid rag in Melbourne. So I'm actually very proud. <laughs> Which, exactly. I hope it's going to funnel the right people through the door. <laughs> what, what, is, what do you labor under as playwrights in terms of reviews and which papers and is there a singular voice in the way? I don't think there's anything anyone who has the kind of power that the New York Times has and I'm very grateful for that because that sounds awful. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's one of the challenges in this country. But it's, it's just, I mean, it's, it, do you, do you feel like the, the I, I don't know that much about the New York Times, but do, do you feel like the I'm kind of critics of that paper have a particular critical standpoint or a particular <laughs> taste? I don't think that's the issue. I don't think that's the issue. I don't even think it's the it's uh, our our industry's criticism of their criticism. It's the fact that by virtue of its influence, it makes decisions for how sellable something will be anywhere. That's all. It's not. I I, I think people who read it regularly might have, you know think more or less about any particular critic, but that's not the issue. It's that a single person uh, in one review can determine the success or failure of that piece, but also can determine what's on everybody's seasons next year. Um, I think I could weigh in on this just a little um, thinking from both countries, that I think the ecology of arts funding has a lot to do with the lesser dependence yeah. on critics. Right. You know, and I think yeah, this speaks sure. to Bridget's question as well, which is, um, think that you know those kind of programs that look outwards are again more to do with the politics of arts funding and the capacity to fund art as something of independent value mm. you know that these things all lock together um, yeah because I mean it, it, that's interesting because it, it puts the economic context in because when you say that about the New York Times and I think you get no disagreement it's an indictment. For me, it's an indictment of the theater community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not about the New York Times. That's, it's that's about exactly the, the people who program. And, and so, what is the economic context of those decisions that they make? Um, I just want to go back to Jamil's point and ask you guys this sense of um, gender equity. For one thing, on on stage in Australia, you know, this is a thirty-year really battle in America that just keeps coming up, and we keep coming back to the exact same statistics, you know, 70, it's actually more like 17% of the plays on uh, American stages are written by women. Um, do you uh, labor under a sense that uh, you have a different kind of struggle as a women playwright in Australia? Statistically, you don't seem to. But you know, I'm really surprised at that statistic, wow. you know, because I, I, I thought, I mean, but what's happened in Australia just recently is there has been this huge kind of, um, you know, again with the hands, but the, you know, kind of rise of indignation of women playwrights and, and a real kind of getting together and um, the, the Arts Council, the Australia Council, um, I think last year wrote a big report on how women were, um, women playwrights, how many were getting up and, you know, asking um, companies to be accountable for that. And I think companies took that on, you know, they, they really did. So I think this year, the um, with the new kind of announcement of which plays are being done is a lot better than last year, and tons better than the year before, and and years before that. You know, that so statistic is wanna, only last year's. And I, I just want to quickly say about that statistic because we mm -hmm. the statistics in there. If anybody has questions about the statistics, please see me. Um, <laughs> no, no, because we assembled them from cobbled them together from different sources. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, that's PWA's, uh, those are PWA's statistics from last year, but from a select group of theaters. Uh, the Australia has a Bureau of Statistics that looks at 
uh, uh, even a smaller group, but of larger theaters, and the statistics for women are much worse. Yeah. At the, of course, you know, upper left. <laughs> Is there a difference? A few questions, David. Are you all aware of? Could you movement? identify, even though we all? I'm oh, sorry, know? David Goldman. I'm an at-large board member. Uh, there's a, um, a group in the Bay Area, uh, which you may know about or not know about, called 50-50-2020. Heard about that? Yeah. Which means parity by the year 2020, and that's a completely devoted group. Now, whether they're going to be successful or not, who knows? But the fact is that it is a groundswell, and it's important, and people are devoted to it. Yeah. You all, so you've heard of it, right? Can I ask, in, in, your, in terms of your Just MFA theory. programs, writing programs, what's the, what's the percentage of... It's uh, much more equivalent. Yeah. Mm. yeah, actually, I think it's a greater, greater probably percentage more the other of women way. in probably more programs women. than more women. women. Yes. Um, and in organizations like, you know, membership-based organizations, Playwright Center, Neutronius, it's very much 50-50 or, or even leaning more towards women. Um, yeah. Other questions? Uh, a lot has been said, Alex. I'm actually, I'm, since we, uh, I'm Zell, I'm the Playwright in Residence at Interact Theater. Um, on the point of, of MFA programs, I'm actually curious to know, like, what the training system is like in Australia in comparison to here, because we, um, uh, as Todd's book pointed out a few years ago, we have a system that is very, very beholden to seven programs in this country, and I, I went to one of them, and I'm very fortunate. But honestly, we don't have a system that, that is where we get the vast, vast majority of our stories and our storytellers. So we're going to places that are very expensive, that require you to be able to take significant time out of your, your life. So if you have family, or if you aren't from a background where you can pay for that type of, take on that type of debt, uh, you don't get a chance to really be a storyteller, I feel like, here. Uh, what is the training system like in Australia? Do you, are you dependent on MFA programs? Are you, how does it, how do you actually get, how do scripts get to theaters? Um, um, we've only, there's only been, I, I mean, I, I don't know that much about the history of Australian theater, but certainly in my time, like, practicing, um, uh, the, the only MFA playwriting course in Australia started last year. There was Nida had a playwright Nida studio. had a playwright studio that was like one one day a week. And it was one afternoon yeah. a week. Um, for a year. And so, <laughs> for a year. It's much more like um, just doing work experience for ages. It, like, I feel like I learned how to write on the job. Completely just and just by doing kind of scratch shows in theaters, which has been a really great thing because I think that I've kind of ended up with uh, I feel like kind of my strength is at kind of like about sculpting live text and about and I think it does mean that there is kind of a greater variability in stories because actually um, you don't need this kind of um, you don't need a degree to make you work on stage, you just kind of need to be good at your job as a writer. But um, and I think we're, we're very different kinds of writers, Declan and myself, because Declan is very involved in making his work, putting his work on the stage, mm. which is great. And and I don't really, I mean, I, I did do that originally, but I don't really do that anymore. So it's very, my work's really reliant on a company picking up a play and doing it. <coughs> and um, and that, you know, has its own, you know, um, kind of momentum, I suppose. You know, you, that's how you kind of learn, seeing your play on and then getting another one up and, you know. Can I, can I ask a quick follow-up? Yeah, sure. Are, so are the theaters there actually accepting of work that isn't by people who have who already have representation or who aren't out of these out of well the non existent programs? Like, are they accepting of how do they how do they accept scripts? How do they find most Australian theater companies don't accept unsolicited manuscripts, but um, the organization Dan works through Playwriting Australia. They you send your script to them, and then they'll generally do kind of like an assessment report or something, and then recommend scripts to theater companies. Mm -hmm. So they kind of they're kind of the intermediated between. Well, yeah, we're kind of the reading. Um, the yeah, and is that or if you have an agent, is that still is that fee based as it used to be at uh, Australian mm -hmm. National Playwright Center? Uh, I don't think it is fee based. No. So you can just send <laughs> cold. You can send your scripts. Also, because the country is so small, I think the. Um, the pathway happens a lot quicker, so if you work with an independent company, say, and you go on in a small theatre and you're not being paid, you're really likely to get Sydney Theatre Company, Griffin, and Belvoir to come and see your show, um, and you can kind of in a year or two break through uh, and, and have your name known to the people that need to know your name and start a relationship. I think that, that relationship happens a lot quicker in Australia. <laughs> 
So I think we have time for a couple more questions, maybe like one or we have about two more minutes. Actually, yeah, Stan. I've actually got a question for American playwrights about um, being in uh, the United States. It's been incredible to hear how much Spanish is spoken mm -hmm. and uh, how, in terms of the demographics and the, the change in demographics, and I wondered in terms of the structure of the industry and the number of uh, Hispanic playwrights coming through, um, how that, that will be. How, how the industry will change over the next couple of years. And, what it, and, and how are you re representing bilingual production as well? I think that's the answer. <laughs> 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 no, no. Barkley, do you want to speak well, to me? I wasn't here. here. I wasn't listening. I'm sorry. Can <laughs> <laughs> you come again? Oh, it's a question about uh, bilingualism here and, and the, the growing presence of Hispanic voices on stage. Uh, well, um, Karen Zacharias is here, who's a Latina playwright. Do you want to speak to that first, and then I'll jump in. Well, I mean, I think it's something that, that American theaters are struggling with, really, because uh, the, the excuse for sometimes not putting on a Latina play is we can't get Latino audiences in to come and see the work, but that doesn't seem to be the problem when they're putting Ibsen, they're not running out to find Swedes. So, um, <laughs> uh, Norwegians. Uh, Norwegians, but uh, exactly. But anyway, um, uh, I, I think it's something that's, that the, the country is struggling with. And, and the fact that Latino is a, is a term to use a multinational, multi-class type of, of, of community that is here that I think we're treated as a foreign entity, people who have not been at the table. And I think just as the politics are turning around and realizing that we can cover the you know, political spectrum, et cetera, it's a roaring lion that's starting to get out of the cage that hopefully we can start shaking things up. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, we've been largely ignored or scared or you know, they, they haven't, we, we haven't been treated as that we're part of the, the fabric of what makes the United States. And I grew up in Mexico. I am really not even a first generation. I'm an immigrant myself. And so in Mexico, the, the big saying is, and this seems like, well, in Australia, poor Mexico, so far from God and so close to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, um, <laughs> um, and it's a prevalent type of feeling of what, I mean, we, there's always this defensiveness that Mexico is part of the Americas, too. We are America as well. And yet moving to the United States is a profound changing influence. That's why so many people are coming here. And I think it's a really interesting, complicated um, story. I mean, Carlos yeah. is um, Puerto Rican and Colombian. I'm Mexican and Danish Lebanese. <laughs> um, and that is what being an American is starting to be. It's yeah. a really interesting. It, it is interesting because people, I think from a producer standpoint, and not only Latino culture, but I think all minority cultures in this country are sort of lumped into these monolithic ideas. So there's an Asian American play. What does that mean? You know, there's hundreds, of, you know, dozens and dozens of countries, and uh, and then the, you know the the uh, various mixtures that we come from, and uh, and I just find it really interesting that there's uh, that that that's even part of the dialogue anymore. And I you know I think one of the interesting things about the last election was looking at the two ballrooms on election night. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and and there's the ballroom in Boston where everyone uh, is glum and everyone is of a certain demographic. Uh, uh, and <laughs> often I walk into theaters, and that is the demographic, you know. Um, and so how, and then a lot of coming and high in the party. Well, how do we outreach, or how do we connect with, you know, minority culture? And and then you go to the ball, ballroom in Chicago, and it's not even a question, you know. It's just the fabric. It's just the reality. We live in a multicultural society. Why, we're not even talking about it in that way. Well, how do we do this kind of outreach? And of course, they're doing that in you know in the back offices and that. But but there's just an ease to it that uh, that I think is entirely absent from the theater in this country. And I hope for the day when you know when all stories are just part of the fabric. The, that the question of like what is American? Yeah. You know, I think there are a handful of theaters in the country that are producing plays uh, because. Uh, you know, I think the Goodman Theater in Chicago is a great example where they do, you know, they do African American plays, Latino plays, uh, you know, traditional uh, white plays, but it's not part of the conversation. Where like, here's here's the Latino play. Here's it's just what they do, you know. And uh, and I hope that more and more theaters will take that mindset uh, as time goes on, because there is a sort of slotting mentality where uh, you know we have a grant to do the uh, multicultural play. So and then there's these like concentric circles of monoliths. So there's the Latino play, and then there's the black play, 
and then there's the Asian play, and then there's the multicultural play. So if we do a multicultural play, we've hit everything. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so if we did the Latina play this year, then we don't have to do the Asian play until next year, you know, or we don't have to do the black play for another three years. So I still think that a lot of the mentality from the 90s, where there was a lot, where there was a real focus on identity, uh, is still part of the vocabulary from the producer standpoint. And I just wish there was uh, more visionary voices uh, that reflected what happened in the ballroom in Chicago. Um, really quickly from Barclay, because we're yeah. at the um, Borderlands Theater, Tucson, Barclay. About 80% of our work is is um, <clears throat> Latino or binational. But there's a song that kept going through my head as you were speaking. Um, and I don't know how many people in the room know it. Um, it's called, and the band played Waltzing Matilda, mm -hmm. which is about returning World War II mm -hmm. veterans to Australia who were wounded. And the play we just did on the border and one of the background songs about with this Mexican family that had a veteran was, and the band played Waltzing Matilda. And that says a lot about what we're doing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barclay. Thank you to everyone. I mean, it's, it's interesting just to, uh, to squeeze in one last word after Carlos, uh, too, is this, this sense that I guess I, it makes me want to say this to you and you guys. Um, uh, you know, the question is also geographical. It is a big country, as Christine said at the beginning. So the uh, Latino population of California is really different from the Latino <coughs> population of New York. And the waves, both not just the wave, demographic waves, but the theatrical waves. So there was a time in the 60s and 70s where Puerto Rican culture was so booming, in, in New York at least, and then Cuban culture, and then, you know, and Miami is so different than, you know, Arizona. And, and so this sense of like wanting you to see our uh, country whole and particular and wanting to see yours in the same way, you know, it's just such an ongoing process. And so I just want to thank everybody for sharing in that. Thank you guys for sharing your work and your thoughts and all weekend. And thanks for bringing us together. And thank you to the people at home. <laughs>